Hey guys, and welcome back to Betwixt the Books. We are doing another reading round table. This time we do have a theme. The theme was a social justice nonfiction book, which is one of our annual buddy read challenge challenges. So we decided to do this one and force other people to join us in on it. And by other people, our lovely friend Emily, who has been on a couple of times, if you haven't seen the other episodes that she was in, we'll link the playlist of the reading round tables up above. If you have have never watched one of these videos essentially it's just us and some of our bookish friends talking about the things that we've been reading recently there isn't always a theme sometimes it's just literally whatever they've been reading at the time um sometimes it's roughly themed like this one is where you could pick anything you want under the umbrella and read something for that um if you have ideas for future challenges or like future um themes that you might be interested in hearing all of us talk about um feel free to leave comments down below with those because uh we are always looking for more ideas when it comes to those um please thank you <laughs> we have yet to send out an email for our like last quarter of the year reading round table so you're input might be used in that case um if it's an idea that we think would be really good um that's it we're gonna go around and introduce ourselves first and then we're gonna talk about our books so <laughs> we'll start with Gretchen hi I'm Gretchen uh in a weird state of affairs you have not seen my face uh that much recently um I had one of the weirdest um versions of the flu I have ever got it was um quite violent and it knocked me on my face for a little while um, so I literally just texted Michaela today. I read a romance novel uh, <laughs> because normally you see me reading romance. Um, every Monday, I usually have an arc review of some kind, and I just have not been doing that. Um, cause, and so that's how you know how bad it was. I couldn't even read my smut. Um, <laughs> uh, so hopefully I'll be back around um, shortly. I know um, one of our Betwixt videos for uh, next month will actually be some romance. So um I have not been doing a lot of reading in general. Um, so I was happy to have this be August's theme because I listened to all of my nonfiction on audio, um, which was easier for me to do while I was ill. <laughs> I didn't want to like read. I was just listening and, and had my eyes closed. Um, so uh, this is very much on theme for me. Um, and I'm... I read something for this that I, I thought was going to be one type of book and it ended up being completely different um, in a good way. So I can't wait to tell you about it. I guess that makes it my turn. Um, I am Emily. I've been on a couple of times to talk about a couple of different things, um, but I am not a regular. Um, I currently work in content marketing um, in the corporate space, uh, but I do a lot of reading in my spare time when I can find the motivation, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. Not a lot to say this week, I guess. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> You're good. Um, you've been seeing more of me on the channel. Hi, I'm Michaela. Uh, I was kind of picking up <laughs> the slack that Gretchen left behind. I think we can only do individual videos on opposite cadence. If Gretchen's making videos, I can't. But if I'm making videos, Gretchen can't. It's wild. Anyway, um, so <laughs> generally, I am a fiction reader. I am not a big nonfiction reader. I will read maybe a couple nonfictions a, a year in general, like three usually. Um, usually because I've made you. Most of the time, yes, it's Gretchen forcing me to. Um, that isn't to say that I, like, avoid nonfiction, because I definitely, like, will pick up ones that I'm interested in myself. Um, I just don't read them at the same quantity that I read fiction. So reading a nonfiction book that I picked myself is totally fair, totally fine. Uh, it's going to be here. And if you watched one of my videos recently, I was talking about how I'm going to try maybe doing one nonfiction book a month for myself, because um, I feel like... I have some and I don't make time for them. <laughs> so I'm going to make myself make time for them. Um, in the opposite way that Gretchen usually listens to her audiobooks, I, when I read nonfiction, active read. So I'm highlighting and sticky noting while I read, which I think is also one of the reasons why I tend to avoid nonfiction is because I feel like I need to spend more time doing it than I do like listening to a fiction book on audio at three times speed. I can't do the same thing with nonfiction. I'm not listening to it sped up in the same way. Um, so in any case, 
going to be talking about nonfiction today. Um, we each, I think, picked something different, a different social justice area. So that that will, I think, be interesting to talk about. We'll have some different discussions. And uh, yeah, I also do think that um, I, I like I feel like having discussions like this in general, it feels like it's like a very leftist thing, like like we're trying to pick up books from other people other cultures other identities in general to like learn about i feel like listening to people who are different than you um is is so important and i we talked about it here there is like a, a a defensive response a lot when something negative is said about somebody who looks like you or even you in general that you identify with but when you take the time to remove yourself and just listen, just listen to what they're saying, even if you disagree with it, sometimes one of their points will resonate with you and it will let you interrogate yourself because we're all a product of everything that we've been told our entire lives. And if you are only listening to people who are the same as you, you never have the opportunity to grow or change your mind. Um, so like, take a, take a chance, give yourself the challenge of reading a social justice nonfiction book, even if it's one that you agree with, um, because then maybe it will give you a perspective on something else that you disagree with and you might learn from it. So I, mean, I enjoy I, this challenge, even though I'm not a big nonfiction reader. It's always fun for me anyway. <laughs> Cause I also want to say as someone who, um, and this, I've, I've talked about this in plenty of my American president's challenge videos. Um, I don't do it um, as frequently because, again, I, from either side, I do not want to read, like, vitriolic trek, right? Like, I don't want to read somebody's, like, polemic on, on either side. Like, even if yeah. I was going to agree with the screaming person, I do not want to read the screaming person. I'm not <laughs> interested in it. I want things that are informed and well thought out. And I have, and I mean, this is documented on our, on our channel read books by conservative thinkers, by conservative historians. Um, I do not identify that way, um, but I know that since I'm engaged in the conversation, I am not going to get anywhere if I only listen to one side. Um, and so that's why I really also like, you know, you might go into it and I've definitely done this, I'm feeling very strongly that I am going to disagree yes. <laughs> with everything that is about to be said. Um, but you also, I think when I've done that, have found points of overlap mm -hmm. and then have a better understanding of where we diverge in that thinking as well. Um, so yes, like, so while I chose, I chose something that I wanted to be uplifting about white supremacy, which sounds a little bit weird, I understand. Um, but like, it's all part of, and just the work that I do and stuff like that, trying to be better informed, yeah. to form a better future for all of us. Yeah. Because as siloed as we might be by social media, by, you know, our, any type of media, that we, you know, you can get kind of what you believe in, you know, you don't have to listen to the same stuff. We all have to live here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like globalization has made the world very small. So, you know, highly agree with what Michaela said, you know, take, you might think you know about something, read a book that you will learn more. You know, mm -hmm. you might think you feel something some way, you know, read a book uninformed, yeah. you know, we're not, I'm I'm not advocating for some of the wild stuff that gets put in a book, yeah. but like, you know, people who are genuinely trying to present some type of formulated cogent argument, yes, cogent <laughs> sourced, yeah, you know, yeah, based argument. Um, it's good. We all become better when we learn more. I think. Yeah, I agree. As long as we're doling out advice, uh, the I have like the the best piece of advice I can genuinely give to anybody in the entire world, especially when it comes to like 
learning new things or picking up like nonfiction books or learning just in general, learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to sit in your discomfort and not let your brain turn off because you're uncomfortable. The thing about a lot of academic works or just like exploratory nonfiction topics, big topics like this that prompt the kind of discussions we've had today, like the reality is that you only know what you know. And until you start reading things from people who know stuff you don't know, yeah. you're never going to know what it is you don't know. And when you're reading these things and you start feeling like maybe this is a little accusatory or like maybe I'm a little too in this argument right now maybe instead of putting the book down and going I don't want to deal with that anymore because it's uncomfortable finish reading the argument and sit with it for a hot minute you don't have to agree with it or come around to it you can sit with it for five minutes and go no I still think it's bullshit that's a hundred percent valid that's a hundred percent like reasonable even that's legitimate that's fine but you have to sit with it for five minutes first. Like you have to be able and willing to sit in uncertainty, in discomfort, in I think I may have fucked up somewhere in my past. Yeah. And this is pointing that out to me in a way that I'm not comfortable acknowledging right now. Like it's yeah. so important to acknowledge those things because the sooner you do it, the sooner you can be a better person. And I am reasonably certain it was Maya Angelou who said, you do what you can until you know better. And when you know better, you do better. Do better. Mm-hmm. Let's start with Gretchen. What did you listen to? Um, I just, I always love when we talk about this too, because it's so funny about how everyone is such a different reader, mm-hmm. right? Um, because I listen to my nonfiction um, because sometimes when I'm reading a book, if I start to get like a little bit bored or like the ADHD kicks in, I'll like start to skim a little bit. And then I feel like I've missed really important information. So I listen to it on audio because I don't skip. I'm like Mm. listening. Um, And I'm lucky enough to be a very active, like I can intake (laughs) information auditorily. I know that's not um, huge for some people, but I am a PhD student. um, And so I do plenty of reading and highlighting and sticky noting. And I will go back to some of these and buy the physical copy and actually read it again a second time and do that. Um, And so for people who don't know, my work is in elementary social studies um, and specifically how um, critical whiteness studies and um, American myth making really like shows up in children's literature. Um, And that is what kind of led me to this book. And it has a long title, so I have to read it off of the page. (laughs) Um, So it's The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the path to a shared American future by Robert P. Jones. Now, you probably can't really see this cover. Yeah, um, that's the cover. And um, I'm gonna be honest with you. Part of the reason why this maybe is not what I expected it to be is because I don't actually know that I read the description before I put this book on hold. Like, I kid you not. Um, I saw that, and because I feel like a lot of times I have unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean, I read this to learn, right? I believe knowledge is power. Um, but a lot of times when you're talking about white supremacy stuff, it's not uplifting. I mean, it's not m- meant to be, right? Um, it's hard history. Um, but I do feel like that can also be very heavy. Um, and so I think I'm pretty sure, um, I put this on hold literally because I just saw and a path to a shared American future. Um, and I thought, oh, this might be not necessarily uplifting, but like there is a path forward here. Um, and so just gonna, I want to read you this, taking the story of white supremacy in America back to 1493 and examining contemporary communities in Mississippi, Minnesota, and Oklahoma for models of racial repair. Um, This book helps chart a new course toward a genuinely pluralistic pluralistic democracy. There we go. I can say that word. Um, I was not ready, but incredibly interested for how this book showed how, this is basically three different communities in those three different states, reckoning with the history, the violent history that has taken place um, in those communities and how it is 
remember today and what that remembrance means for reckoning. Um, because, you know, you can, sometimes we have an issue where something has happened and people won't even put up a plaque, right? A memorial. But at the same time, there's putting up a plaque and saying, you know, we recognize this happens here or actually taking steps towards a racial reckoning. Um, and so the three places, um, I feel like two of them are, are more well known. So one of them is um, the Emmett Till murder. Um, and that's one of the stories. Um, the other one is the uh, Tulsa race massacre. Um, and then the other one was a story that I was not familiar with about the lynching of some um, black circus workers that were in town with the circus and um, falsely accused of attacking a, a white woman. Um, and so I'm very interested in how we tell history, right? Because the way we literally tell it, like shapes that story. Um, and so again, I didn't, I didn't realize, like I didn't really read the description, right? And that's what this whole book was about. It was like remembering and, and storying these things. Because for the longest time, just to go, I mean, you know, how many of us learned about Emmett Till in school, right? Um, how many, how many times is the Tulsa race massacre like in our history books? Like not a lot, right? Unless you're taking a specific like African American history course. Um, and all three episodes were of racial violence against um, African Americans. Um, so it is a very hard book to read um, because it does obviously give the details of this violence. Um, and then also like, so particularly for one that might be more, I don't know, more well-known to people. I, I know a lot of things and then I say things to other people and I'm like, yeah, you know, this history thing. And people look at me and I'm like, oh, that's right. I'm weird. <laughs> um, but essentially um, there are very famous photos of um, Emmett Till, who was a child who um, was murdered, um, having an open casket funeral because his mom was like, mm -hmm. I want you to see what they've done to my child. Mm -hmm. um, and so telling the story of Emmett Till's murder was like a really powerful thing for his mom, even at that point. Um, cat. Um, Sorry. And, but then it's like, it's also something this community has tried to forget. Um, and now there is um, a memorial site um, and a museum and it's like the whole story of how the, these communities like came together, um, particularly with the, um, I believe it's the Tulsa Race Massacre, um, the combination of white allies and African-American community members, and some of whom like were put on this path because they know they're descended from people who enacted that violence and have taken it upon themselves to like help push for remembering. Um, there was this really, really powerful story about a white sheriff. And you'll forgive me, I read this a while ago, so I can't remember if it was a race massacre or the lynched um, circus workers, but whose um, ancestor had taken part in this violence and through the community push to have a remembrance site for these people, it really made him look more closely at himself and also as a, as a white lawmaker, a white policeman, um, police brutality. And so he is someone who has gone, I don't want to say out of his way, but it's been like very important for him, you know, to stop that cycle and to like he's the sheriff in this town and to have you know a, a far more racially um informed police force and this was a journey for him that was started by being a part of this project to remember this historical event um so like i said it, it was not what i expected but i really i found it very powerful i think mm -hmm. i ended up giving it like five stars um, and I'm, I'm speaking about it in a very positive way. Obviously the author is very aware that just having a remembrance site, right, is not enough. And having these sites has not fixed the problem. Like, um, there were 
issues. I think of all three of these places where plaques or statues were like vandalized by people who still, um, you know, so it's, I, I certainly don't want anyone to come away with the idea that this book is like, if we only did this and we'd fix everything, and like we wouldn't have these problems anymore. Um, but I think it's, it's a very powerful set of stories um, that show you what real commitment to remembrance and that impact that it can have on the, on the present and then on the future um, as well. Um, parts of the description when I reread it um, for this video um, also claim to connect the white supremacist roots that kind of underpin all of this, not only in these episodes, but also why it's so hard to have remembrance spaces. Um, and then connects it also to Native Americans. Um, and there is some interconnectivity between the stories to like how like this blueprint in this time also represents how Native Americans were treated. Um, I think in the description, it says like, um, you know, along the way, he shows the connections between Emmett Till and the Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto in the Mississippi Delta, between the lynching of three black circus workers and the mass execution of 38 Lakota men in Duluth, and between the murder of 300 African Americans during the burning of Black Wall Street in Tulsa and the Trail of Tears. I don't want to say that, that information is not there because those stories are told. Um, and it probably does far more linking between how these white supremacist blueprints have been used against African Americans and Native Americans. Um, but again, the three focal stories are about African American racial violence. Um, and so while it, I do believe that it is important to make those full connections, because obviously um, it is part of that fabric. Um, I don't know necessarily, but like, if you read that description, you might think that it's, I don't know, a more equal representation than I think it ends up being in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do, I, I do like thank him for at least including that, like, you know, don't think that this is just an African American problem or don't think that, you know, white supremacy is everywhere. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, it's not that he's saying it's going to fix all of our issues, but in terms of like reading one of these books about white supremacy and coming out the other side feeling more empowered than just like, wow, like um, there's definitely, like I said, it is a lot of wow right in the gut. But um, so yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, especially if you are interested in how we remember and tell the stories of um, particularly racial violence in the South. But um, it's definitely interesting because I feel like I definitely learned about Emmett Till in school, but I feel like it was high school and the U.S. history teacher that I had was definitely like more of a left leaning history teacher I don't think I learned about the Tulsa race riots at all growing up. I, that's something that I learned about as an adult. Um, and then obviously that third one I had never heard of. And you also said that you had never heard of. So it, it the like movement that's been happening here in the U.S. of like, don't talk about all the bad stuff that we've done in the past. <laughs> like it's already, it, it's already a thing. Like it's not, yeah, they're spreading the boundary. <laughs> it feels like it's, it's, yeah. And it's, it's interesting because, like, conversely, I went to school in the Midwest, really in the middle of nowhere, and, like, in a really economically repressed area, so, like, everyone around me was relatively right-leaning, um, but we learned about the Tulsa race riots, huh. but I think, like, Emmett Till was basically a footnote as part of, like, everything else, like, we, I know, I knew the name, and, like, we covered it but it was really just like oh also this is a thing that happened that's like contributing to the problem but we don't have to talk about that mm. and it's really interesting to see like which bits each school and each teacher picks and chooses to tell because like it's hard to feel like there's not an agenda there of some <laughs> kind and because it's yep. so individualized to the teachers in the schools like it's hard to be like well there's a conspiracy attached to it 
but there's clearly an agenda. And I think yeah. that we have to keep that in mind with like literally every retelling of anything historical is there is always an agenda to the way it is chosen down to the exact word choices in the order that they are in. Like everyone has, I mean- I, Publishing an article about that. <laughs> yes, but like that's the thing is like any time anyone tells a story about anything, there is an agenda attached to it. And like, yeah. it's great when that agenda is like innocent or innocuous or not, like just conveying something. But when you look at history, like, and especially with big things like this, like we really do have to examine who's telling the story, what are they leaving out? Who are they including and why? Yeah. Well, and it's just like, I mean, just the change and, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying this is like a call out, but like, you know, it was commonly known as the Tulsa race riots. Yes. That has been changed to yeah, the Tulsa race yeah. massacre for a reason. Right. Yeah. And like, I mean, that's, and I don't, I, that's purposeful. Yeah. Um, and it's intentional and it's amazing what that one yeah. changing one word does. Um, and that's, I mean, and so when you said that, I was like, cause that's literally, I mean, I focus on vocabulary definitions. Right. And so like how literally a vocabulary definition is phrased. Um, so I'm, I'm right there with a you. Riot. Yeah. It was yeah. taught to me as riots, which is why like, even now, like discussing it as the massacre that it was. And like, I know I've listened to podcasts about it and everything. I yeah, know yeah. it was a massacre. It wasn't a riot, but I, because I was taught to me that way, like that's still how I talk about it. And that oh, is yeah. something I like, obviously I need to work on now that I've identified it. But like, that's the thing is like the way that you tell these stories to people for the first time matters so much. It yeah. makes me wonder how history books are going to look at the George Floyd situation because they're even in real time, we're hearing riots versus protests mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and in our own country being like how are you you're you're spinning it already already we're spinning well it. and you also have to consider i mean textbooks as a commercial entity right two of the three biggest textbook markets are florida and texas the other texas one is california defines, per, texas defines all like second primary and secondary school educate publication textbooks it is Texas. Texas decides all of it because Texas buys so many books Yep. that the publishing companies are just like, you know what, whatever, we're not going to create different curriculum like text blocks for other states. When Texas is our biggest customer, everyone's yeah. going to match Texas. So when Texas decides they're not going to teach us the thing, the rest of us don't get to learn about it. Yeah. Well, and also with the um, Common Core, which was enacted mm -hmm. in 2010, and the push towards standardized testing, history is not uh, on the standardized test block. So there are schools that have full on removed history or social studies from the curriculum to focus mm -hmm. on um, because funding is now tied to test scores. Mm -hmm. So why would you focus on something? Um, anyway, I have a lot of feelings about social studies. <laughs> I, I am not I am not going to give you so literally my like what I do. Right. Yeah. I have a several 50 page plus papers on this feeling um so I, i'm not gonna do my ted talk i'm gonna keep it inside I've, yeah i've talked multiple times when we've done discussions like this about how my pretty left-leaning massachusetts school system was so bad at teaching history none of my history classes made it past uh civil rights i don't think so i never learned in school anything about like korean vietnam war never learned about any of that like modern history at all that's because didn't you know the civil rights movement fixed everything it fixed all the problems guys there was nothing else after nothing that else after that nothing happened 1960s were good um yeah like that... minus the assassinations like ignore those and everything's great yeah, now we're fine um but then on top of that i was hearing stories of kids the grade below me as a senior in high school so the juniors did not know like that the wild west and the civil war were happening at the same time like they couldn't place in history where things yeah. happened yeah mm -hmm. like they yeah. and they were like when when did the civil rights movement happen and they're like i don't know like 1900 like they couldn't even like tell you like 
when in history any yeah. of this like they're being told of these events but not where they were or how they're still yeah. relevant or how yeah. close to us right now they were yeah. so like there's a and again very left-leaning massachusetts core of like democratic new england like that's where i was so it, it's not just a mm-hmm. left right-leaning southern slash whatever problem it's across the country <laughs> And lest either of you or anybody else thinks this is a new problem with public education. No, no. My So my dad is 56, 7. My dad turned 57 this year. His younger brother is seven years younger than him. Between the time that my dad graduated high school and my his younger brother, seven years, between the time those two graduated high school, they stopped teaching that the reason World War II ended was because we dropped a bomb on Japan. My uncle did not know that literally World War II ended because we dropped multiple nukes on Japan. They didn't teach them that. They were just like, well, we signed a treaty. It was over. It was fine. It's over. That was it. Like, that was the whole thing. And my parents had to, like, educate my uncle on the rest of the fucking story. It's it's wild, honestly. Yeah. The things that, like, schools think they can get away with over time. Yeah. And again, I just want to stress, too, when we think about, like, you know, because the things in this book, um and the things like you know because they're not in textbooks right and that's Mm -hmm. part of the things but like I mean um you know James Lowen has a has this great like lies across America book in which he interrogates like different plaques or like like you might not realize it but like just like the stupid historical plaques that you like you walk by on like a historical building or something there is sometimes some wild stuff going on in there and obviously like you know there was the whole discussion of confederate monuments and you know what we do there um and so like these these spaces of public history as well that Mm -hmm. um affect people's daily lives or the names of our streets like different stuff like that um this is a nod towards what i know michaela's gonna be talking about but one of the most interesting things i had seen was so is was very common um for um white people to take the um religious objects and sacred objects of native americans other people as well but a lot of native american stuff um native american skeletons um and put them in our museums it's not just related to native americans but i was at the um field museum in chicago and they have a like early history of america slash native american um part of their exhibit and you know in a museum space matters there are people who have master's degrees who their they their master's degree is how to think about how you move through a space and what story that is told right so things aren't just in a museum because they look pretty on that wall like they're, they're put there in a reason um and space is at a premium right? You only have the space that you have and and you want to interpret that space. What the Field Museum had done, I'd never seen anyone do this before, is they had an entire like section of this um, that they had just covered and they had on it and they were like previously displayed here was um, Native American um, bones and sacred artifacts that have been repatriated and returned Mm -hmm. um, to the tribes in question. and so, like, acknowledging that history by not having anything there, but the thing that said why this space was not being used, um, and apologizing for that. And, like, I had never seen something that used that much, because it was a huge part of this exhibit. Um, so I just want to say also that I think like moves like that are being made now that weren't being made in the past um, that make sure that those artifacts and the people that were on display in a museum when they should have been honored in a burial ground with their ancestors so their ancestors could honor them. Um, Like, and then not just ignoring that that was a thing that happened, right? And not just putting other stuff. Yeah, just replace it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, when you like every little thing, like as someone, if you go to a museum, you look at a plaque, like whatever it is, like look at the language that they use um, and what's there. It's always, there's always a little fascinating story to tell. 
Um, I swear, I swear I'm not going to have more of a TED talk than that. I'm going to stop. Just but. go listen to James A. Caster's entire jokey bit about the British Museum. Always entertaining. We're and not talking done about looking this. at it yet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, Always you can't good. have your dead people back. We're still looking at them. Yep. So, um, yeah, it's it's a funny way to bring up an issue, but it was like a cool way to bring it up. Proud of him for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, John Oliver's last um bit was on hawaii yes, um yes. so lest we also just when i say native american and you think about a very specific thing remember that like we forcibly annexed a native nation of hawaii um which we are still um n- totally just stomping all over yep. um, but i bring it up also because john oliver also made an excellent british museum joke uh in that as well but if you're also interested in like how um issues of you know, Native Hawaiians are still being stomped on in the year 2024. Don Oliver had a great, um, a great 30-ish minute segment on his show as well. On that note, Emily, you want to tell us about gender? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) I'll do my best. Um, So for this one, I read Judith Butler's newest book, Who is Afraid of Gender? Um, My camera's mirrored, so that's backwards, whatever. Um, Judith Butler um, is a fairly well-known scholar on the matter of gender. Uh, They have published a couple of books about it in the past, including Gender Trouble, which is the one listed at the bottom of this. Um, I will also point out from the top, because I'm sure to get it wrong as I'm talking through this book, um, a couple of years ago when California opened up the option to use an X gender marker for non-binary on licenses, um, Judith has taken them up on that. And so now using they, them pronouns, um, this is like, it does, it comes up sort of according to it, like at the end, toward the end of the book. Um, But like Taylor knew that before me. So we've talked about it, but I will do my very best to make sure I they them correctly the whole time. Um, So Who's Afraid of Gender is a really, really interesting and compelling book that is looking at and not just interrogating, but dissecting a lot of the, the, I have no other way to call it, but a brouhaha about all of the like gender stuff in modern society, particularly in Western civilization, but not exclusively. Um, Butler's view throughout this book does look global. There are issues discussed um, about Poland and Russia, and I think also, I mean, they uh, talk about a couple of countries in South America as well, because they have been in the news in the past couple of years for doing stuff um, that was, in a manner of speaking, untoward. But I really enjoyed this book because I felt like it approached the topic in probably the most, like, level-headed, even-keeled perspective and just, like, approach I have encountered on any media about this gender issue to date. Um, I I listened to it on on Spotify um, because it's available at the moment, and um, Judith actually does the reading for this one. So um, I got to listen to Judith, like read their own book for me, which I found incredibly valuable as well. Um, They are a master orator for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I found them incredibly easy to follow. And for the first time, maybe ever on my own, I did not listen to this at an accelerated speed. I listened to it at one X because I wanted to understand it. And, like, I have auditory processing issues, so I know that, like, if I speed it up, odds are I'm going to start missing bits because I will miss, like, two words, and then my brain is like, well, I don't know, and then the rest of it is garble. So, and that's just a thing. So, um, but, like, Judith really breaks down the issue um, in terms of a phantasm where basically the the argument put forth is that gender ideology has become a phantasm for a lot of these people, particularly the political right in the United States. Um, and um, like religious people and then uh, TERFs. 
So like those three groups in particular um, are engaging with, and like I caveat, not unilaterally, not every human being, blah, blah, blah. But the idea of a phantasm is that it is a figment of the imagination. It's an illusion. It is something, and that's such a simple explanation that it doesn't really get to the heart of it. A phantasm is really what happens when you take, or a person takes a personal fear or an insecurity about something. It is usually economic in nature, but not always. Sometimes it is like familial or just interrelationship related. Um, but it usually comes down to a fear, an uncertainty, an insecurity of some kind that is then projected outward onto the world to seek literally any other responsible party, like anything that could be responsible for this feeling that doesn't require me to do any work about it, basically. And so, you know, for a lot of like, with Catholicism, the typical refrain is about sexual abuse. And we all know that's a projection because the sexual abuse issue within the Catholic Church is and has been really, really bad for a really long time, and they don't want to address that. So they're pointing the finger outwards. For conservatives, a lot of them are afraid of losing the inherent power that they hold when the patriarchal nuclear family unit is considered the default, when they are considered the default and everybody else is weird. It means they get to set all of the rules and it means that everything else and any other idea looks like a personal attack. And so like that's part of where a lot of the vitriol for um, like the gender ideology quotes, big humongous air quotes, like that's where a lot of this comes from for certain groups of the population that are engaging in this um there's so much happening in this book and like the arguments are so like they're they're very straightforward while also being so encompassing that they become complex where it's like i don't necessarily it's not like i need to list off every element of the argument for you to understand the like the thing being put forth it's just that everything judith put forward into this book is so compelling and reasonable and like i was incredibly impressed with how patient and how like generous ultimately um butler is in some of like their readings on some of like articles and various like things that other people have been doing and arguments that other people have put forth and like it just engaging with it ah i came up with the other thing i was trying to say the rest of it that i found really valuable is that especially for institutions like Extre really like st extreme religion um, and some conservatives, a lot of like the furthest right wing, right leaning. Um, it comes down to a, basically a fundamental misunderstanding of how academia works, um, which I found really interesting and compelling because it actually clarified a lot of like confused like frustrations and confusions that I've had for a really long time about attitudes toward academia that I could never really understand and I feel like Judith really puts it into such straightforward terms in this that I personally actually feel a lot better about existing in the world right now um and basically what it comes to is that because of the way that Christianity in particular does its teachings and like perpetuates itself more or less, the idea is that you are supposed to accept any teaching as gospel. The people that are leading your religious education are the people that you are supposed to just listen to. Like, you're not really supposed to ask questions, and you're not supposed to challenge it, and you're not supposed to consider any other options because God said these are the ones, right? And so, like, for them, their religion thing becomes a framework, and it's if you are engaging in it, that means you believe in it. That means you support it. That means you are it. So for them to look at an academic exploration of a topic like gender and sexuality and stuff like this, where all of us are, you know, all of these scholars are looking at it and going, well, there's any number of ways you could express yourself. There's any number of ways a family could present itself. There's any number of ways you could look at this and do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, 
QRS, whatever. Like there, there's not just one way to do this. There's actually a bajillion ways you can do this. And no one of them is any more right than any of the others. For them to even engage in the subject at all within a classroom is to accept it wholesale, is to adopt anything your teacher says as truth. And that's what you believe in now. Like there is no separation for critical thinking. There's no space for interpretation or like personal processing or breaking things down or hearing an argument and saying, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't see it that way because I'm seeing these things too. They're not seeing any of these things. And I will say one more time for the people in the back, this is not, a, this is a generalization. This is only for some people. This is not for all of the people. Anyway, um, just saying it again, there's a limit to how many, how far you can go making all of the are, generalizations. Are but. humans not monoliths? What? Oh my God, crazy. No, wild. I know. Anyway, um, so like just... But it's it, that it, those two big buckets of conversation are really the core of this particular nonfiction book. Um, and it's a little bit heavy to get through at, at times just because like it is especially like being attached to a trans person. Like it is hard to listen to some of this stuff just because like even though Judith is present, D Butler is presenting. I'm not friends with Judith. Even though <laughs> Butler is presenting it. Like, in such a straightforward and, like, overall compassionate manner, like, they're not doing things in a way that's like, look at this bitch and see what she said. Like, it's never like that. Like, even the section of the book that's talking about J.K. Rowling and how that whole thing goes, like, Butler tr awards her so much, like, space, basically, while also tearing her to shreds, don't get me wrong. Like, Butler has no patience for JKR, but in the text, she's treating, they continue to treat this topic and all of the arguments, like they break the whole thing down and they give yeah. her like that opportunity to be like, I had these traumas because I was in an abusive relationship and I, you know, went through all of these things and I'm always going to have these fears. And you're like, okay, I get that. That's sympathetic. I understand you. And then she goes on to say something to the effect of like, so really, I'm sympathizing with all of these trans women because I understand in a way that no one else can. And then immediately transitions to, but all of you are actually men masquerading as women and all of you want to rape a woman, so you're all dangerous because penises are weapons. So that's, and like, that's really what it comes down to. And so like yeah. the last like chapter and a half of this book is breaking that whole concept down in a way that's like almost excessive, but I feel like it really drives home the point where it's like, why are we trying to insist that a sex organ on its own is an like is violence like we can't like it is a tool the same way that any other blunt instrument can be used as a tool to create to like perform invasive damage and traumas like there's nothing inherently actually dangerous about a penis or the possession of one like there's nothing inherently violent about that and yeah. acting like, like there is is part of what's creating a bigger problem for men right now in, in that like they are also suffering under this patriarchy thing that's telling them all of these things they need to be and all of these things that they are and can't do anything about and violent is one of them and i don't think that's fair yeah. i don't think that's right i think that we like as a society really really need to just work really hard to get away from that because there is nothing inherently dangerous about a human being or about a body part yeah, yeah. like there's certainly like, nothing just... inherently da dangerous about a gender yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i think too is then this is just like because again as someone in trying to be in academia um and i mean i'm certainly have like citations to my name now um, but, um, I think too, there's like this fundamental misunderstanding of the word critical in critical thinking that has become a thing, yeah. um, because like, I'll talk about people. And so like my recent research right now is on George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And for some people, those two men are like godlike, you know, they're up on a pedestal. They're the and best so when men I that ever lived, we should all be like them. 
I mean, if they were all David Diggs, maybe. Um, <laughs> but um, so it's, it, you know, when I say, oh, yeah, and it's like, because the, the field of study that I work in is called critical literacy. Um, mm-hmm. And people are like, oh, like, critical, like, and they take that in a negative way. And I think that's part of the problem also is like, you know, because I'll talk to people like, oh, you're just like really like negative about America. And I was like, critical doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, it's not a negative connotation. I suppose it can be if like my line of evidence or reasoning like disagrees with you and you feel attacked by that. I'm sure that then that feels negative. But at the same time, critical thinking, critical literacy, it's not inherently negative. Um, but it's like, again, words have meaning. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, there's a strong percentage of the population that has taken like, critical thinking and critical literacy and made it inherently negative. When really, mm-hmm. it's just like, I want to look at this thing from all the angles. Yeah. And, and I'm going to evaluate evidence. I want to understand it. And I want to understand more than just this much of it. I want to understand all of it. Yeah. And like, yeah, so it's, it's a quite a bit of book to get through. I think it was a 12 hour listen on Spotify, something to that effect. Um, I really, really love this idea of the phantasm and, you know, because I'm, I'm me and like, I'm immediately like this other thing that I read and like cross, yes. you know, because like, that's, that's my PhD brain now. Um, mm-hmm. Because there's also for anyone who's interested in like kind of a concept of this as well, there's a book my citation on it is 2022 because there was a repub of it but it's um called racecraft um by a a, they're either mother and daughter or cousins i can't remember um so it's fields and fields are the last names and there's literally an entire chapter in there where they align racecraft and witchcraft Mm -hmm. in the sense of like um they basically break racial stuff into like race racism and racecraft um and so like race is obviously the idea that being a different colored skin has all of these different properties and meanings yeah and then like that like is codified into racism which is like legal like stuff like that and then race craft is like all the other stuff um and so i feel like it's a very similar not the same but a similar argument in which half of this stuff exists because we believe it Mm -hmm. you know and that's like the entire propping up of it (laughs) yeah um and so like i mean because just the idea that the idea of gender is an idea right yeah and how you think about that idea Mm -hmm. gives you the words and the categories that you use um so I love I love that as a as a concept because I do feel like sometimes like you're trying to like like listen to some of these arguments and you're like what yeah. <laughs> like I don't I can't I can't I'm trying yeah. deeply to understand and that's why I'm also really glad that sometimes like in an argument like that with what Butler is making you kind of have to knock down every Mm -hmm. domino um and those kinds of arguments can be like you said a lot of a lot of a lot um but it's kind of like you have to address all of those arguments in order to like make your point yeah i thought it was laid out really well um like organized very Mm -hmm. well i think that the way that they go through the topics in the order that they're in. I think it all makes sense. And I think it builds pretty well. Um, Even like moving between these two topics that are kind of like two sides of a similar coin. Um, And like the, the can't comprehend what like a critical reading of something is versus like, just if you are consuming it, you're agreeing with it. That was kind of a short thing and toward the beginning that I think was more um, to like help in establishing how phantasms get started yeah. really. Um, but I thought it was really valuable context. Um, I like certain parts of this book are a bit of a lot. 
for sure. But I would say that like, even if you aren't coming into this book with a large social justice vocabulary or a large gender ideology vocabulary or whatever, like you're still going to be able to process this book. I thought it was relatively straightforward. Um, it is certainly academic in tone and there are parts of it that like for sentence construction definitely are academic <laughs> in yeah. tone. Um, but like having, having done higher education for six and a half years between graduate, you know, undergrad and grad school. Um, it is also probably some of the most like accessible academic literature I have consumed to date, which is incredibly valuable because I am really tired of people spinning in circles and pretending that makes them smart. Listen, as an academic, I would like to say screw highfalutin academic language. I am of the opinion that if people cannot understand your argument, why are you You didn't it? do a good job. Yeah. Like what it why do we need you do not okay, I'm glad you you memorized all of the seven syllable words from the SAT. You didn't need to use them all here. <laughs> like it it I don't Yeah. And I also think and I mean there and this is the issue too that I was I was talking to Michaela and um, I haven't reviewed this book on, um, on the channel yet, but I will eventually. I read this book titled um, White Rural Rage, subtitle The Threat to American Democracy. And I think I said this in my Goodreads review, and I was talking to Michaela about this too, which is that like sometimes, again, these books are put out and they, they want to be sold. They are commercial products. But I... I I have so many issues also with like that book, like that title is very aggressive for what the subject ends up being. And it's that kind of thing that I wish that I could share with certain people and be like, listen, I want to have like a substantive conversation about our different views. Um, would you read this and then like discuss it with me? And I just know just from the title that the people who need to read it won't 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 yeah. because like that book it, it it ends up like giving an entire like the whole end of it is like um a path forward towards a more basically a more powerful rural america that actually has its needs represented for all people um rather than like continuously being like ignored and um in ways that are fueling rage that's not productive mm -hmm. against the wrong things um, and so like, there is a powerful path forward to really, to really make change in a positive way in that book. But the people who need to read it are not going to read it just from the title alone, right? It, and so it positions itself as an adversary to that type of person with the title. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I definitely would say that like some of, especially some of the um, opening chapters may also like be a little bit adversarial and I think that's the problem sometimes with like even the book that I brought actually brought for today or like you know Emily's book like the people that you wish you could hand it to and just be like would you please um and then we can discuss yeah. like you know I'm not I have my opinions but I would like to have a discussion with you based on you know some, some kind people, of mutual understanding. Some people really struggle to take a step back from the page when they're reading a nonfiction book that is about a sensitive topic like this or like either of the ones you guys have. Like some people are not capable of hearing something that makes them go, mm, and then take a step back and follow it through to see where it goes. Because once you hit the, hmm, they stop. And they immediately become adversarial. And I have very personal experience with some people like this. So I am not making it up. Um, <laughs> I think they we will all not have. Yeah. They yeah. will not read the rest of it. They won't even yeah. finish the sentence because they've decided that they know where it's going from these seven words alone. Yeah. It's incredibly yeah. frustrating to deal with when you want to have productive conversations with these people about anything. And it's like, I can't even give you the tools to share a common language because you won't consume it. Yeah. 
But it also brings me back to me in school, growing up in the early 2000s when uh, sexuality was a thing and being one of the only people in my school who had gay parents. I have gay dads. So I had a unique experience that like most of the people in my school did not have. The number of times people asked me, aren't you afraid they're going to sexually assault you? And I had to go, first of all, they're my parents, so no. Second of all, they're gay and I'm a woman, so why would that even work? Like, I'm already not what I'm attracted to. Third of all, what the hell? Like, why are you asking me Who just me says this? that to somebody? Multiple times. Multiple times. <laughs> Different Ew. people saying that to me. And it, like, literally was just like, oh, you have just never interacted. <laughs> like, you've just never interacted Also, sexual with violence person. is also committed by straight parents. Parents, yeah. Any step-parent could, they're not your parent. So even biological parents do it. Like you can't, what? <laughs> yeah, a person's sexual orientation has absolutely no. zero to do with their intention or lack thereof to perform sexual violence on another person, minor yeah. or otherwise. Minor or otherwise. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, but- It has to do with power and yeah. control. It it just always gets related to sexual violence. Mm -hmm. I, I I find it's like it whatever it is is like people are like I can have the moral high ground because this other person is mm -hmm. capable of or will do sexual violence, and yeah. it's like any single person period is capable yes. of that. No matter of any other thing, are they a person? They're capable of it. Yes, but I think it's important that while we are also recognizing that, I think it's also important that, like, we are also taking a step back from that recognition to go, okay, but, like, when I'm meeting people on the street, I can't just assume that every person out there is going to attempt to rape me. Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And, like, I think the thing with, like, just to tag it back to, like, my book with the discussion and toward the end about, like, is a penis actually violent? Does violence persist through penises? Is that how this works? I don't think it is because there are millions, billions of men who have never hurt anybody or anything. Yeah. And there are plenty of women who commit sexual violence. Yeah. So clearly the yeah. anatomy attached has nothing to do with it. Yeah. And we like... <laughs> yes. Anytime you have created an absolute category of anything. Yep. It work. is unlikely to be. It's just and it, and and like literally, literally anything like, and I think that's like going back to like the binary or like static categories again. This is why we run into a problem of like critical thinking is inherently negative. Yeah. Right. And and, and I mean, I had you understand, right? I mean, we all want stability in our world, right? We want the world to make sense in some way. Mm -hmm. Like I understand yeah. that I am sitting like on a couch, right? So like, I mean, we there are some things that we can all agree are fairly stable, yeah. like understandings, but it's like when we take that to the extreme, like with anything, it's bad. Um, so again, like I, I understand the, the desire for stability and the safety and the comfort that people get from trying to categorize their world. I was reading this book, um, it's called Fantasyland, um, a 500 year history of America. Um, and it's basically how the author's point is like that America has a very special history of like, a, he calls it the fantasy industrial complex playing off a of Dwight Eisenhower quote of like imagining the world in the way that we want it to be in the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, but he makes this differentiation and I always butcher it. And I think he's quoting somebody else, but the difference between stories that um, put coins in your own pocket and stories that take coins out of the pocket of someone else, right? So that there are things that we can believe that comfort us and support us and they can be wild and um, you know, not make sense to anybody else, but as long as they, they're mine and they have some kind of positive effect and they don't hurt other people. Like, because once your personal beliefs begin to hurt other people, then it's an issue. Yeah. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I've always really, I, that was, I, I'm not even, even sure that's the quote anymore, but that's the idea. Um, so that's another really good um, book for anyone who's interested. It really made a lot of things make sense for me in my personal life. When we're moving into me, I'm going to start this off with the uh, just admission that I have not finished this book. So I haven't read all of it. So I can't talk about the thing in its in its entirety, but I will talk about what I have read. Um, I picked up The Rediscovery of America by Ned Blackhawk, which was a National Book Award winner last year. Um, this is attempting to do the thing that Gretchen was talking about, where we are reframing American history from the perspective of the indigenous cultures, because every single American history book that talks about the entire history of the United States is from the perspective of the colonizers, because that's who has power. So we're going to talk about every single thing that happened from where history started in America, which is uh, Columbus coming to the United States, pretty much. Um But we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the indigenous folks and what it was like for them when they were here, as opposed to like the conquerors who came and took all the land and whatever happened. So every single historical event that happened just from their perspective. Um, The part that I read was literally just first contact because there are three separate sections just on that. We're going to talk about the Spanish when they came here and what they did, the French when they came here and what they did and the English when they came here and what they did, because we can't talk about American history without talking about all of those different um, conquerors coming in and having influence over different indigenous groups. Um, At the very beginning, there is a map that talks about all of the different indigenous cultures that were here pre-Columbus, because I think we don't talk about that as a culture of like how many people were actually here, because most of the time history sort of talks about America as being like this wide open space where nobody lived and we just came and took it over and it was like no actually there was like millions if not billions of people living here they just got decimated by disease so these first three sections and every single time I just kept texting Gretchen being like wow it's literally like there were three million people here and then they came back a second time and there was 500 and it's because of all of the diseases that white people brought to North America that they had not had any inoculation to because they didn't have it because they were separate. It was biowarfare before biowarfare was a thing. Um, and the history of North America specifically would be very different if it weren't for that, I think, because almost every single time these in these first sections they aren't talked about a lot and he talks about it in in the way of like you're not going to talk about your losses really when you're talking about when you're a conqueror you're not going to talk about the battles you lost but if you're like we're a couple hundred dudes on a boat that showed up and met the aztecs and the aztecs are like millions strong of course you're losing any battles you have there but then you come back five years later And a bunch of those people have died from disease and went from million strong to thousand strong. Now your chances of winning in a battle are much better. On top of the fact that that Europeans had guns and a lot of these pre-Columbian Native American folks didn't have metal work in that same way. um, You now have increased your odds even more. So if you look at my little flaggies, all of the little red flags are like places where... um, there was just like insane devastation either from disease or from like a massacre like DeSoto coming in and just being like I'm gonna kill a bunch of people because I'm pissed off at them and I can um we're gonna cut off hands and limbs and enslave people and that's what's gonna happen so the Spanish each of the sections starts with a retelling of a first account of like something that was going on and then inside that section it'll be okay and here's like one historical figure and what happened here here's another event the spanish section goes by like regions so we're going to talk about the caribbean we're going to talk about central america and mexico we're going to talk about like florida new mexico north america area that the spanish came up towards um the english sections can be like we're going to talk about massachusetts and we're going to talk about virginia and these two separate sections because they had different 
ways of interacting with the indigenous cultures there. And then the French, obviously, talking about coming over and like Quebec and like that area. And then also how they moved down through like Central America through the Mississippi Basin. Um, so it is doing it regionally as well as like historical figure based. Um, this early section of the book is obviously very devastating because all of it is like, and then they all died of disease. <laughs> um and it's obviously not going to get much better i know that as we move forward it's going to talk about things like trail of tears it's going to go into things about like the way that um residential schools and the way that we used those to decimate indigenous culture um because one of the main things that is being talked about here is that the front of colonialism was not just killing all of these people in warfare it was also trying to erase all their cultures or assimilate their cultures depending on who you were like the spanish were very much like we're bringing catholicism and you're all going to be catholic and we're converting all of you whereas the puritans come over and while they did try to do that they did less of that they were much more we are god's people and we can enslave you to do our work um and the french seemed less interested in doing some of the religious stuff to start with they were much more of like what resources can we take in like fur and trapping spanish also were like we're here for gold and silver we're not here so much for the people they did do enslavement but they brought a lot more african slaves pretty quickly um so it was happening everywhere but it was much more prevalent the enslavement portion was much more prevalent in the english section which is a theme for us <laughs> in general the americans are going to come over here and just start enslaving people um with, with that being said so the doctrine of discovery just so we're clear is what this yes. thing is called um which was the um religious um justification for coming over here and like being able to plant your flag and saying i have that by the way was blessed by the pope yes so just to be clear in case anybody's like where did this come from um, I've been reading a lot about Jefferson <laughs> and the Doctrine of Discovery. Yeah. And um, my new thing was learning that the Doctrine of Discovery was not just like a thing somebody made up, but it was like the Pope, the Pope said yes. Yeah. And that was that was news to me. God, so God I was created like, the earth whoa. and because we uh, are of God, that for therefore means that anything of the earth is ours, essentially. Mm -hmm. And we can go and take it because it's yeah, ours. But only if you're a Christian. Yes, yeah. Which it was used to justify literally everything, like okay. people, resources, it doesn't matter because uh, God created it and because God is with us, it's ours. Um, yeah. So that's what this one is. Um, it's super interesting to read a history book like this because like it's sad at the beginning of this and like we've talked about most of the history stuff is from the perspective of the conquerors because you won, right? Or more or less one um so you're going to write your books from the perspective of winning from the perspective of like all of the yeah. historical stories that were told about this time period are like and we came here and and we got all of this stuff and it was great and we then we were the birthplace of liberty you know like like it's the the history around the creation of our country is very well, and I'm also different. really interested to see um, as it goes forward, because like, mm. so um, for viewers, if you didn't see it, Michaela and I did a joint review of Claudio Sant's book, Unworthy Republic, The Dispossession mm. of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory. And that was very interesting as well. Um, but and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that you did this on purpose. I'm uh. just like, this is something that is is done a lot is like, you know, you, you have in history, you have like, you know, we come over, right? And there's the mm -hmm. pilgrims and um, they, they definitely meet Native Americans in, yes. in New England. Yes. Um, and then somehow those New England people, New England Native Americans kind of just fall away. They don't like, exist anymore. Where did they go? You get the French and Indian War, which, by the way, I've been reading a whole bunch of kids books on George Washington who fought in the French and Indian War. And you would not believe the number of them that do not mention Native Americans at all, despite the fact that the war is named the French, the and, French Indian and Indian War. And they say that the French and the British fought each other. And I'm like, then why does it have this name? But anyway, um, they don't so exist. Like also, they're gone. I feel like a lot of times when we talk about um, Native American issues, specifically, um, just specifically United States, um, like, it's kind of like you think about it when you think about westward expansion yes right 
And I'm not saying that that's not terrible. Yes. Because it obviously is. But I think there's a lot of forgetting or erasure of the fact that like the reason that we had anywhere to expand from is because we had already minimized, murdered, pushed yes. aside the Native Americans that were here, specifically, again, specifically New England. Obviously, the French were down in, and Spanish were down in like Florida and New Orleans. There was like all of that's going on. Yes. But specifically Native American issues too. Um, and to be able to like, like where, where do you think all of this like justification for, and like this anger of like, what do you mean we can't go West? Right. This is one of the reasons we fight the American Revolution is because to thank Native Americans that sided with us during the French and Indian War, King George goes, do not go past these mountains. And yep. colonists were like, we are going to fight a war because we want to go past these mountains. Um, yeah. And so. Anyway, sorry, I was just like, no, it, it's, yeah. just, it's been even as I've been reading history about this part of american history they are never really there yeah um it's i think it is in part because of how much devastation the diseases did that mm -hmm. the kind of like first settlement there were people there but they weren't like in the numbers that would be required for them to be significant and obviously like all of these smaller tribes had to come together to fight off the colonialism. But as soon as, as they like win, they, um, one of the sec, one of the ones that they talk about in the Spanish section are like the Pueblo in Indians, because they were like a pretty large group, um, were able to fight off Spanish, like overrule because all of these smaller Pueblo tribes came together to fight them off. But then as soon as, the Spanish were like run out of there, they start infighting with themselves, which is mm -hmm. not helpful when it comes to like overall longevity. Because once they're not actually one homogenous group, there are thousands of different tribes that are all facing one common enemy. Mm -hmm. But as soon as that con common enemy goes away, they're fighting each other and then the disease comes in on top of that. Mm -hmm. So when you're infighting on top of getting decimated by a plague on top of an actual threat from the outside coming in to take all of your resources you don't stand a chance when it comes to surviving that yeah, yeah. and i mean individual actors who also you know saw that they could get one over yes. on their neighbors by making a deal because that's yes. how most of these land deals happen is they yes. found one person willing to write yes on a treaty Yes. And the rest of the people were like, uh, but now there's like a legal document. Yeah. That guy didn't system. have authority over the rest of us. So yes. like he didn't actually have the authority to sell you that. So you don't actually own that. And they go, well, I paid for it. So now it's mine. Well, and I mean, in indigenous land, indigenous land rights. And that, that's not the, I don't even want to say the legal system is not the same, but conception of yes. land ownership is not even. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Because they're like, why you can't own? Yes, yeah. That's not how this works. You just are here right now. Like, yeah. You mean like, own it? Feel free and come here and live here because none of us own this land. But then the colonists were like, this is ours now. And then the people were like, what do you what do you mean? No, no, that's <laughs> what not are you how talking that works. about? What are you talking about? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. No, it's it's definitely a problem. Um, in general in the same way that like we don't talk a lot about the like negative aspects of african american history in specifics the same way we really don't talk about indigenous history we don't talk about like one of the courses that i took in college was um native american history based and the discussion of like yes okay so they have land granted to them through treaties that's how you get like these it used to be like casinos are only on indigenous lands because they are their own country in a way mm -hmm. um so they can make their own rules and they could put gambling and so people would go there for gambling for instance um the way that those that people get their indigenous rights is through blood quantum so you basically have to say i'm this percentage of 
of Indian in order to be considered Indian for the government, because that's the term that's used like legally for the government. Um, that's another way that it's used to slowly try and get rid of indigenous culture is because if you interbreed now, quote unquote, interbreed, if you marry a white person, your children are only 50%. And if they marry a white person, their child is only 25%. And at what point are you no longer indigenous? <laughs> at what point are you now erased? Um, because it be if you make the community small enough they can no longer support themselves because the genes are no longer varied enough and you're just getting inbreeding, right? And that causes problems. So do you force your, resign yourself to decimation from inbreeding? Do you resign yourself to decimation culturally because you can no longer get the legal rights that you have been given because you have not enough quote unquote Indian blood? And in like, it's, it's so many different fronts that are put towards modern day indigenous people to slowly continue to, to wipe them out, let alone things like boarding schools where we're going to make you only speak English and only, only worship, worship our God and get rid of all of your culture and your language and everything else. Like there's so many different fronts that this is on and I'm sure it's all going to get touched upon at some point. My one green sticky note on residential school from the introduction. I'm sure I'm going to have more green sticky notes towards the later half of this book, but like, it's really I, rough. <laughs> one thing that's really, and I mean, I highly recommend people look this up. It is really interesting. Um, I was doing this because I uh, was writing a paper on George Washington and Native Americans. Um, and there are active, um, like, legal movements to enforce, like, the treaty of new york one of these treaties that was signed by washington because like they would sign treaties and then invalidate them and then just be like well it was never real and so there are actually like legal proceedings um right now about enforcement of treaties signed back in the 1700s and some of them obviously have been stuck in a in a quagmire but some of them have actually been successful too mm -hmm. um and um you know, part of it, the, the issue now, right, is that so much of this land that was stolen um, is now in use, right? Mm -hmm. It's anything from a national park to there's like, um, you know, a sewer system or something. Um, and so part of it is like, well, what would giving this land back even mean? Yeah. Um, but the, the idea that it would be like symbolic um, native stewardship of these um ancestral lands and spaces so i was doing a lot of, i'm not going to belabor the point um but yeah. i was doing some research on this and it really is um interesting to like these things that happened during for me just because of where i'm researching like treaties washington sign yeah. and you're thinking like what does that have to do with me now right with us now are still things that are being like litigated in yep. our courts right now um so it's it's not just history y'all it history lives every day in its consequences um yeah and mm -hmm. in you know what it has meant to us now so it i've i've become a little bit of a legal nut um <laughs> over the last six months or so i like listen to multiple legal podcasts now because of who i am as a person sure um but it is it is really interesting and i will also say that the Treaty of New York, which we signed with the Cherokee Nation, was the first international treaty that was um, like litigated in Congress, um, or li like litigated by Washington, and or, um, like as something that was like you know he wrote, and then it was the first time that people were really like, well, what does it mean to get the advice and consent? advice and consent of the Senate. And it is the only time that the president tried to interpret that, like literally, right? Because we didn't know how to interpret it. It was a weird yeah. new nation. Yeah. Washington shows up in Congress and he's like, hey, I have this treaty. Um, I would like your advice. Um, and George Washington got so mad <laughs> at how everyone in Congress was trying to like pick and chew at this treaty that he said, F this, I'm never doing this again. 
Um, I'm never ever going to bring you an in-process treaty. I'm only ever going to bring back a treaty that's completely done for Finish, like the yeah. advice and content of the Senate. Um, and that is why to this day, no other president has ever done that because that was precedent set by the Treaty of New York, which we signed with the Greeks. So, you know, there's tons of legal precedent set on this stuff, guys. And I'm sorry. Yeah. I just, I needed to get some weird trivia that I know in here somewhere. But sorry. No, it's good. That's... <sighs> All of this stuff is very connected in its way. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a internet comedian named Sarah Shower who does like social media stuff, but she's been every single month reading a couple nonfiction books and she does like a TikTok talking about them and she'll do it based on the themed months. So like Black History Month, she's reading nonfiction books about African-American history, so on and so forth. She did disability pride for uh, July, I think, because it's disability month, so on and so forth. And she was talking about how, because people were asking her how she picks which books to read. And she says, I try to do like a Venn diagram where I'm like picking things that overlap a little bit and mm -hmm. everything overlaps somehow. So yeah. if you're picking a book on like autism rep, like maybe the next book you go to is about um, some other disability group, but you pick something that has like a similar theme maybe it's another mental health group or maybe yeah. it's like i don't know whatever and it I is like... you try and find overlap and you can always find overlap it does not matter what book you're looking at there's probably something from your last book that will reflect onto this yeah. one <laughs> and i think that's something that has kept me reading like like i said like i picked up my book for this this month um just based on the title and i was like interesting i want to know and i feel like i've become so much more of like free for all with my nonfiction picks for that very reason it's yeah. like every single time I pick up something and I'm like oh this will be like different and like totally off over here and I'm like no actually this impacts it and I think you know part of also when you were saying like you know people can't put similar history events on yeah. a timeline is yeah. when we get so focused on these things as like siloed yes. concepts we miss the larger connections both historical like you know historical but also just like how broad you know nothing is ever its own thing um and i do want to say in case anyone is interested in michaela's book um or has already read michaela's book and is, is wondering i did i almost also picked a native american history book um to bring to today but i then changed when i knew what michaela yeah. was doing for variety um, but there's this book called Native Nations, A Millennium in North America by Kathleen Duvall. Um, I do not know anything about it. It looks like that. Um, but I found it because there is an extremely long um, quote from Claudio Sant um, on the front um, blurbing this book. So in case anyone wants to extend that, that was my almost pick. Um, this is much longer. It is a 22 hour audiobook, which is also another reason that I did not end up choosing it. So this has been a long discussion. It has been a deep discussion. It has been a good discussion. Um, if you're still here, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, we have covered a lot of topics and um, a lot of great um, conversation has been had. Um, of course, these are only three books and only, you know, three short conversations about three um, incredibly um, deep and interesting books. So obviously I'm sure we could have sat here for another several hours and continue to talk about them. Um, Cause these conversations, like you said, they're never over. Um, you just learn a little more and you keep going and you read the next one or you read something else and you know, you continue to think. So thank you for thinking with us for as long as this video has been. As Michaela mentioned at the top, we are still um, like, we haven't emailed our group of participants for our final quarter reading roundtables yet. Um, so we are still thinking through some themes. Um, we have some potentially very special things planned for the end of the year, but we are still soliciting ideas um, for future reading roundtables. So if you have any ideas, um, even if we don't use it this quarter, we may, we have a whole, a whole other year. <laughs> um with them coming up so um please do if you have any ideas that you of books that you would like to see us do in this roundtable format um please leave them in the comments um and then if you haven't as a plug for a video that is already up um Michaela and I posted this month what is um one of my favorite videos 
that we have ever done. Uh, Michaela and I both turned 30 this year and we made a video called 30 Books for 30 Years. Um, we filmed it sitting right here on my couch uh, together in the same space. I continued, to, I was like poking her. I was like, you really here? Um, Cause I can't, is I can't snow poking. Right. Um, but you should definitely go back and watch that if you haven't. Um, we recommend 30 amazing books that have shaped us as people um, and tell some great stories. So um, there's some great content um, already here and coming up and we will see you for them. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.